Well, welcome everyone, all of our RC Missouri members and guests. My name is Stacy Davidson and I'm the president of RC Missouri. It's my pleasure to welcome you here today for the first RC Missouri event of 2023. It is RC Missouri's mission to celebrate and share the cultures and histories of Egypt from the ancient through Islamic periods with Missouri and its neighboring communities. We are pleased that our virtual events are able to expand our programming beyond those geographic areas, and we are welcome to uh, welcome our national and international attendees to this event. You can stay up to date with RC Missouri news and events by following us on our social media. We're on Facebook, Twitter, or you can access our website. Although bo both RC National and RC Missouri provide free public outreach events, some lectures, workshops, and benefits are restricted to RC members. If you enjoy RC Missouri programming and would like to be more involved in our organization, you can visit the Join RC section of our website. At registration, you can select Kansas City, Missouri to affiliate with our chapter. We have a very special presentation for you today. It is the first event in RC Missouri's professionalization series, which aims to build and strengthen practical skills students, academics, and the public need to be successful in their studies and career opportunities. The series is also intended to foster cross-disciplinary and creative dialogue in a friendly, low-stress setting. Today's talk is Strategies for Creating an Index for a Monograph or Edited Volume. Dr. Brian Brinkman will offer his thoughts on how to use time efficiently in this process, as well as what makes a good index. Having created three indices for different types of books, he will share his experiences and the methods he has learned for indexing. Dr. Brinkman is Assistant Professor in World Languages and Cultures at Missouri State University. He re received his PhD in Ancient History from Brown University in 2016. He recently co-edited Beyond Egypt, Relations and Imaginations of the Ancient Past in 2022, which was a special volume from the proceedings of the second annual Missouri Egyptological Symposium. We will also have some time for Q&A at the end of the presentation, or you can use the chat function as we go through our session. Um, you should be able to see that in the Q&A box on your taskbar. I would like to thank RC Missouri Vice President, Dr. Julia Troche for hosting the event. And without further ado, let's extend a warm RC Missouri welcome to Dr. Brian Brinkman. Yeah, thank you for inviting me for this um, first, as you mentioned, in the professionalization series. Um, I know part of the lecture series you've done with RC Missouri, there have been some really interesting talks and I've been able to attend some of them. This is obviously gonna be a little bit different. I'm not going to say that it's not going to be interesting, um, and hopefully it will be, but again, it's, it's focusing on particular skills and professionalization. And um, part of the reason I'm really happy to present this to you today, um, not that I would consider myself any sort of expert on this, I, I'll talk about this, uh, my experience, I sort of learned in the trenches a little bit how to do this. And that's why I'm really looking forward to at least being able to share my ideas, because when I first, um, I first did a index for um, my graduate advisor in grad school. I right? asked me if I wanted to do it. And so being a researcher, of course, an academic, I, I, I scoured for um, mostly online and some traditional print even for strategies on how to create an index. And I didn't find much, to be honest. Um, maybe there have been some better things published since then, um, but I was pretty lost. Um, and so you're learning from my mistakes in some ways. Right, for what I'm presenting for you. Um, you. There may come a time, again, I'm sure most people on here are, are academics or, or um, students um, working on their academic careers, um, but there might be a time where you're asked to create an index, right? And so I'm hoping to at least impart some of these main principles, and I'll tell you my strategies for actually doing this, right? And those things you can probably adapt a little bit, but at least I hope it'll put you in a kind of mind frame um, that you don't feel completely lost like I did when I first encountered this. So at least you will have um, put some thought into it. So, you know, whether it's your own book, which is probably going to be the case for, for many of you, right? Or you might be asked to index for somebody else, right? Which was, um, has been the case for me by and large, right? Um, so breaking this down into basically four parts. So first I'm going to talk about some of the principles that I think are important um, when we're creating an index. Um, and it's not just, uh, any index, but I guess what I mean are principles for creating a good index, an efficient index. Um, secondly, what I'm calling strategies, this is basically, I'm just gonna tell you my actual process, more or less, right? And this has evolved over time. Um, and it's something that we're, uh, I'm still tweaking, I'm sure if I do another index again, hopefully it'll be my own book next time. Um, but, but if I do, um, I, I might 
continue to adapt to this, but but I'll tell you kind of the nuts and bolts of, of what I do and um, and hopefully that, that will be particularly beneficial to you. I'm gonna do a brief exercise and, and we'll be putting in the chat um, a link. I'll have it on, um, on the uh, PowerPoint here as well, but there'll be a link for um, a page that we're gonna basically work together on doing. Um, so we'll get to that. And then finally, just uh, one brief sort of um, section on additional considerations about an index, um, things to think about from my perspective, and then um, opening it up to, to questions and, and discussion. And um, if there's anyone on here, and I wouldn't be surprised, who's also done an index before, um, to share your thoughts, I, I would absolutely love it, and, and I'm sure others would as well. Right? Okay, so principles, right? What makes a good index? Right? So I'm going to talk about this as the kind of starting point, which is to bear in mind, and this might sound it is a little more philosophical, but I think it's actually really important for creating, again, a good index, right? Not just any index, but one that's efficient, right? So bear in mind that this is an intellectual exercise and not just an algorithm, right? You're not just finding individual terms and spitting them back out. This is a lesson that I learned my very first time doing an index, right? Um, secondly, th this might seem a little obvious, but it's really, really fundamental, which is to think like a reader, right? And again, this is particularly going to be important if what you end up in indexing is your own book because you'll have to kind of put yourself in a different mind space um, then certainly by the time you get to an index you've been working with this project probably for several years at that point um, so we'll talk a little bit about that um, next is the idea of concept versus vocabulary right and just to stress the point that what you're indexing isn't vocabulary now it corresponds to individual terms but really you should think about it as indexing concepts um, next is making connections, right? And here's a, hits a little bit more on the kind of practical side of, of what I'll be talking about. But in a good index, right, it's you'll need meta categories, subcategories, cross listing, all of those elements. Right? So we'll kind of talk a little bit about that. Um, finally, recognizing limitations, right? You can't a, a good index also means not having everything indexed. That wouldn't be helpful, right? And so recognizing the limitations of of, of what really should go into an index, not just in terms of the primary entries, but also in terms of things like cross-listing, right? It, it's not practical to cross-list every single possibility. So this, again, going back to the very first point about this being an intellectual exercise, right? This is where those kind of elements come in. Okay, so I'll expand a little bit on, on these principles first, right? So again, intellectual exercise, not just an algorithm. Um, as an indexer, I, I, this is where I've sort of landed is I tend to think of it as a kind of final step as a type of editor, right? Which is what you're doing. If you think about it, you're when you create the index, you're controlling the accessibility of certain types of information in the book, right? Um, and again, this will hit on what we talk about when I talk about things like a reader. Um, if somebody, when they approach, and this is all of us have this experience as academics, right? Um, maybe the first thing you go to is the index. Right, so we can think of specific cases where you're the kind of hold the gateway to that, right? If you leave out certain concepts, right? I'm going to try to not use the the term term, right, or vocabulary. But if you leave out certain concepts from from the book, right, and and they're present in in the argument, right, in the book, but they're not in the index, you're robbing somebody of not just them getting that information, right? But it's not good for for the book for the author either, right? And so I, I don't want to make this sound you know, overly substantive in terms of your role as, a, as an indexer, but you really do control access, right? You're, for many readers, types of readers, they're gonna be the first point of entry into the argument and the information in the book, right? So just kind of bear that in mind. Again, this is a little more philosophical, but I think important, right? And this is where things come in and we'll talk about this as like categorization and cross-listing, right? Then this is, as I mentioned, right, probably, uh, the most important lesson in the first thing that I ever did when I sat down to index a book was was basically this, right? Um, I literally created, and I'll probably use this anecdote later for other examples of why this doesn't work. I literally created um, a massive Excel sheet with all of the vocabulary in the actual book itself, right? And I thought, well, of course, then I can just like count up the entries and find where they are, right? And I'll talk about how something like that can be useful as a kind of check later. Right. But, but that ended up being not only not helpful, but a waste of time. Right. One of the things I want to aim at a little bit here today is best use of your time as well. Um, I think and it's true. It takes it takes time. Right. Um, I think 
basically all of the books I ended up reading through a total of maybe about three times at least, right? Um, not including all of the actual work going into it, but just reading through it three times um, by, by the end, um, in addition to cataloging everything, right? So it seems kind of daunting maybe in terms of time. So one of the things I wanna aim at again is just um, efficient use of time, right? So thinking about categorization and cross-listing, right? Okay, the second slightly less philosophical, I think a little more practical, but as um, essential is the idea to think like a reader. Okay. Again, it maybe seems obvious, but especially if it's your own monograph, right? Or even the editor of a, of a volume, um, you're probably in a little better shape in that case, right? But if it's your monograph, like you have to put yourself in the headspace of a reader, right? Um, and, and even if it's not your work, you still have to do the same thing, right? And again, from I'm, I'm assume most people on here are, are have done, are in, um, academics in some some form have done some sort of scholarship, right? And so um, this is one of the things that that uh, you'll be familiar with because we all use indices, right? Arguably, um, for probably most books that we approach, if we're doing like you know a, a scholarly work of some sort, right? We're trying to look for information for research. I think very rarely do you really like start from the beginning of any book, right? An academic book and read through it. Right, unless it happens to be like a subfield, or you kind of know what what's already in it, you're just curious where it, where it fits within the scholarship or something. You're probably starting looking for specific bits of information, right? Because if it, it maps perfectly onto what you're already doing in your research, there's no point for you to make that that research because it already exists, right? So just thinking about who will be reading the book and for what purpose. I know this seems obvious, but again, if we're talking about academic books, right, um, and and these are going to be you know, there's going to be variations on this because some are going to be maybe a little more accessible. Um, things like textbooks usually have, they're supposed to, right, indices. That's going to be a little bit different, right? Um, but also bear in mind that let's say it's it's something like um, Julia's, Tro Dr. Trochet's book, which is going to be one of the examples. I did the index for that. So it's going to be one of the examples we're looking at, right? Um, probably most people that are reading that are people like who are on this Zoom and other Egyptologists and other scholars, right? But not always. And also bear in mind that um, we have different levels of readers, right? So you have maybe advanced, even advanced undergraduate students, or yeah, advanced undergraduate students, let's say, or early career grad students, right? They're going to have a slightly different approach. And it's important to keep these in mind, right? And then you'll have uh, educated non-specialists, Right. And, and probably in case of like Julia's book, even though I did that, I, I'd consider myself that, right? I'm an ancient historian, but I work more in, in the classical side of stuff than Egypt particularly, right? So I'm gonna approach that differently than um, if some of you that, that are like on the board of, of RC Missouri, right? Are, who are more within like, um, you know, tr traditionally within Egyptology, right? So, so bear that in mind, right? Um, so one of the kind of practical aspects of this uh, and thinking about the different reader groups is to not assume that the reader is going to approach uh, the work or the index, right, um, with the same assumed vocabulary, especially if it's very specialized, right? And we'll see maybe some specific examples of this, again, looking at, at Julia's book, right? Um, but I want to give one, one example that, that doesn't come from that, right? So let's say, for instance, that you're doing a work on Ptolemaic Egypt, right? Um, and, and a reader, it doesn't matter who they are necessarily, right? Let's say they're an educated non-specialist, right? Um, let's say they're a classicist, but they don't work in, in Ptolemaic Egypt, whatever, right? So they're interested in rulers, right? And I'm gonna use the term ruler for whatever that means, right? People who have power, the most neutral term for that, right? What are the different things, and they wanna look for this, right? They're, they're interested in, um, you know, aspects of, of ideology of rulership or something, right? But they just want to start first with looking at rulers, right? And so they're going to turn to the index, right? What are the different things they might look up? Well, they might think Pharaoh, right? Um, if we're thinking of Ptolemaic Egypt, and for the, I'm sure many of you are very familiar with this, right? It, it kind of makes sense in certain contexts, right? It's probably not the best use of, uh, or not, not the most appropriate term in, in most instances, probably for, for Ptolemaic Egypt. But it certainly is appropriate in some cases. And if you're coming from kind of an outside perspective, right, this is a term that is used of, of the Ptolemies, right? And, um, and so this might be the thing you think of first, because you're thinking, I'm going to differentiate what I think of as, you know, um, as a classicist from what is Egyptian, I'm going to look at Pharaoh, right? They might, and this would probably be what I, the terminology I would use would be like king, probably, right? So they might look at king, 
look for king and, and ruler, right? By the way, they might also look for ruler, right? That's one example of this, right? Or they might even be more specialized and they might think to look for basileus, right? Which is the Greek term for king, right? So just in these different examples, you can, the point of this, right, is to think like a reader. So now what do you do with that information, okay? So this is where things like cross-listing come in, right? Um, you might have ruler might not be the worst thing. It's a little neutral. It's probably not specific enough, right? But let's say you had like king, right? You might have king and then, um, you know, all of the entries there. And then under pharaoh, you might have pharaoh in, in the entry, right? And then it'll be crosses and it'll just say see king, right? Or basileus, maybe if you think somebody's going to use that term, right? See king, right? So thinking like a reader, right? What vocabulary are they going to come with um, um, and, and assuming that, right? So you can help them out. This is where you're helping them. Right. Okay. So one kind of like specific example of that. Next is this notion of, of concept versus vocabulary. Um, as I already mentioned, you should approach this thinking that you're indexing not individual terms, but individual concepts and concepts that are interconnected within an argument within a book. Um, and, and so, uh, you know, a, a good index isn't just a catalog of in individual terms, right? And where they appear in a book. Now, it, this is kind of one of the things it does, right? But this isn't actually how that functions, right? So this goes back to that anecdote that, that I mentioned before of, of the very first thing I did when I was first tasked with creating an index was literally just putting in an Excel sheet every damn word in the book, basically, um, and figuring it out that way. And it, it just doesn't work, right? And then from a kind of hedging a little more on the philosophical idea as well, right? This is where the concept is much more helpful, right? Approaching it in that way. I'm gonna give a, an example of this um, from, for instance, a, another book that I indexed. This one isn't from Julius, right? But something like citizenship. Okay, so um, this is a, a huge topic, right? And, and kind of abstract in certain ways. And again, we'll see some specific examples with um, um, the Julius book in a moment for this as well, right? How often do you think the term citizenship actually appears in the book itself? Well, probably a few times, right? But do you think that every instance that um, where the book is touching on something fundamental about a discussion of citizenship, right? In this case, we're talking about Rome, um, that, that they actually use the term citizenship? Not very often, right? And so you have to actually read the book. This is why I say, I mean, I know that seems obvious, but you have to read it as both looking for the vocabulary and as a reader. Right, and thinking about where the concepts are, right? So, and this is where you can also break these things down further as well, right? But citizenship, again, is a good instance of a kind of concept where it's, it's all over the place, right? And to that same um, point as well, and here's a little bit more of a kind of practical thing to think about. And I know you're a, everyone that's ever read a, a, an index is aware of this, but, but when you first approach it, you don't necessarily think about it this way. And again, this is where you have to be a reader first. Right, is, is how many pages is, is a discussion, right? How many pages are, are spanned, right, in a discussion? Like, let's take citizenship, right? The term citizenship might be on page 41, right? And then it doesn't appear for the next 15 pages, right? But those 15 pages are absolutely talking about citizenship, right? And so you, that's your job, right, is to figure out where the concept is, excuse me, and where you know, even regardless of the terminology, right, regardless of if it's only used once and continues for 15 pages, that's your job um, to create a good index is to say it goes from these pages, all 15 pages, right? And this is one of the reasons why, you know, the word searches, as I mentioned, again, aren't, aren't particularly useful as well, right? Okay, so a couple of the examples, most of the examples I'm going to be using are um, from Dr. Trochet's book, Julia's book. Um, this is a good plug for it, for the, anybody that doesn't have it, right? Um, and hopefully you can see this okay, right? Some of these are gonna be harder and that's why we, we linked to um, one of the pages as well, but we won't get to that just yet, right? So I wanna give some more just specific practical examples of, of this idea um, of, of working with concept and, and where that comes in. So something like memory, right, is a really good one. And this is, um, if you've read Julie's book, right, is, is a pretty important point for what it's talking about because it's, it's sort of, um, you know, it's not necessarily the central thing, right? Um, per se, it's talking about apotheosis, but this is a fundamental part of um, how people are remembered as being divine, I guess, is, is the way of thinking about it, right? So memory is really important, but how many times do you think the term memory actually appears? Well, not, not that many times, actually, 
right? Um, but you can see all the different pages that, that it spans as well, right? And the other thing that, that we'll talk about when we talk about sort of limitations is that there, and I remember this specifically, it's been a few years since I, I did um, this one as well, but there were a couple of instances where memory sort of came up, but it, it, it almost was tangential to the larger argument. And so it wasn't necessarily included in the index because it, it almost distracted from the larger point that was being made about memory, right? So this is the kind of thing, and those are gonna be negotiations you, you make. And again, if it's your own work that you're indexing, you're gonna be most adept at doing that sort of thing, right? Okay. Let's see, so just a couple of examples. Sorry, I was checking the chat in case there's anything for, for me in there, right? Okay, just another brief example of this as well. And then thinking about, um, this is where the idea of, of subcategories and things can come into play, particularly when you're dealing with this aspect, right? Of, of, again, we're, we're thinking about concept over vocabulary, right? So power, um, power, the, the term power does appear in, in this book a number of times, right? But obviously uh, it, it, it gets much more nuanced, right? And so this is the kind of case where not only are you dealing with power, it's your job as the indexer to think about okay, is this, is the concept that's being discussed here, does it fit under this category of power? And if so, right, how can I guide the reader into maybe finding these subcategories that are just going to be more helpful to them? And, and again, like memory, but even more so, something like power is even more kind of, of a gen general term, right, a really important term, but, but something that literally people, you know, anthropologists, political scientists have, have written on the idea of power, right? There's thousands of, of pages that have been written just on this concept because it, it is so broad, right? So again, it's your job to identify where the, the book is talking about power, right? And, and especially when it's particularly important for the overall argument that's being made, right? And then again, where can you help to guide the reader, right? So again, if you can see that this um, in the PowerPoint, okay, right? So power, here's, again, you can see the different pages it spans, like 148 to 155. Again, how many of those cases, I don't know specifically offhand, right? But in those pages, is power mentioned every time? Almost certainly not, right? I'm pretty certain it's, it's not in those cases. But then here's the other thing where you can do to, to break it down because power is such a large concept. It's such a, almost a, a generic kind of term, right? It's really important, but, but it can be used in so many different ways, right? So I break down the definition here, you can see, I give kind of a different example of this, of, of royal power, right? Um, and here, by the way, just one thing to note, because it, it might come up later, but, but one of the things you'll note here, it says um, under royal, right, 15 and 10, um, you should index the notes as well, right? So in footnotes or, or end notes, hopefully you have footnotes, right? Just as kind of an aside, that's one of the things that you're usually gonna be asked to do, right? And then also one of the things that's mentioned here as well as a kind of practical example is, also under power, this is where it comes an intellectual exercise and you're the editor, right? And I think in this case, I was lucky that, that I knew the author pretty well. And so I could, I think we might have had some of these discussions, right? But where a, a, a sort of related term, right? This idea of social capital, does that fit under power? Yeah, kind of. Is it, is it distinct enough from this other discussion, specifically how power is being used in this book, that it deserves its own entry? Yeah. And that's why I put in the cross list, right? So you can start to see where you're building this intellectual exercise of, do I think these are distinct enough in the context of the argument and content of the book that it deserves its own entry? In this case, yeah, right? So you can start to see how this all becomes much more uh, complex to make a good, um, well, I think it's good, hopefully, right? A good index in that way. And again, if, if, you're, if you're doing this, you're the author of this, this is where you're going to have that, that benefit, right? Is that, you, yes, you have to think like a reader, so you have to divorce yourself a little bit from this, but you're going to know, oh, in my argument, this distinction is really important. So I'm going to make two entries for this, right? Okay, so this is the idea of making connections, right? Kind of touched on that a little bit with some of those examples of, as well, right? So the idea of, of think like a reader, so cross-listing and category creations are sort of the examples that we just talked a little bit about, right? Where should something be cross-listed, right? Um, where do we put in, in, in that, right? I'll just add this, that um, not to praise myself to, not that this is some great accomplishment, but to more to highlight the, the idea of how important connections and cross-references are, is that in um, the first book that I uh, did the index for in one of the reviews, um, and I think it was um, in Cambridge, 
reviews of this, but it mentions specifically a useful index with many cross references is added, right? So again, not so much to say that, oh, this was, it was good. I mean, it, it was good at the time. I'm like, oh, that's nice that it, it mentions that. But just the fact that the reviewer, right, pointed out that, that how important and useful cross references are, right? Okay, just another kind of example of the same sort of thing. We're leading on this idea. Here was a really good example of this one. I think we had discussions of this, which again, you, you may have probably more chances to talk to, to authors. And if you're the own, if you're the author of the work that you're indexing, then you can kind of have these discussions with yourself, right? But here was a good specific instance and something that as Egyptologists you'll, you'll appreciate is that um, the, the term that was used is, is divine hereafter. And that's used a lot in the book itself. And obviously that has, um, a kind of important specific meaning within the context of um, Egyptian funerary religion, right, in Egypt in general, right, and it means something that, that's, that is kind of unique to Egyptian culture in, in a certain way. Um, and so the discussion was, okay, uh, should we just have, should we have divine hereafter, because it is used as a number of terms, right, and it's important in that way as its own entry. And here's where it came down to thinking about the reader, right, in the Best case scenario, right? Um, and you have the largest view, readership, right? Um, somebody might approach this who's, again, not necessarily a specialist in this field. Let's say they're interested in apotheosis in ancient India or something, right? This, this isn't going to be the term that they're used to. And so if you look at afterlife, right? And what we did here was cross list this with afterlife um, because that's going to be the most neutral term, right? But by putting in um, divine hereafter as an entry and then alluding and then rather pointing the reader to the idea of afterlife, you're one, highlighting for specialist viewers that this is, um, readers rather, right, that this is an important term in this book, right, so, so, so maybe they're just interested in checking out what is this book about, right, they, they might look for this term and wonder if it's going to be present there. So they'll at least know, okay, this is the terminology that's being used, it gives me a little bit of an insight into um, kind of part of the argument maybe even that the author's making right and, and using this particular terminology but at the same time let's assume that this is just the term and especially as we get specialized within our fields you know you're gonna probably instantly think of like the more specific unique term to your field because it's probably the terminology you use in discussions and in your own research right so this also just has that practical benefit of let's say you're a specialist you're an Egyptologist you know and you think divine hereafter and that's kind of the first thing that comes to mind maybe right okay you check there if 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 I just let if we just left out divine hereafter entirely yeah and I'll get to this point right they they're probably smart enough to figure out okay let, let's let's look after at afterlife or some other entries right but this just gives them that benefit and it saves them that time as well right Okay, here's another one. And part of these ones that I wanna highlight here from, from kind of practical examples are um, some of the more difficult ones that, that I, I dealt with. And again, some of these, I think we had, um, I was lucky enough to have discussions with the author about, right? Um, gods, right? If you can see this one here, um, obviously really important. Um, they come into play in, in the argument in, in certain specific ways, right? It's talking about the, the book, right? Is more about, I mean, the author can tell us, but the, the book's more about um, sort of apotheosis of, of humans, right? But the gods certainly are, are at play there. Um, and so what do we do with that, right? Do these all um, have, should these all have individual entries for each god that's mentioned? And part of the reason why we settled on this, or I settled on this, right? Um, it, as having it kind of gods as the main entry, right? Is that um, some gods are only mentioned like one time, as you can see on here, right? Or maybe two times. Right, so not very often, um, and so maybe not necessarily worth the real estate that it actually takes up in in the uh, index itself, right? Um, to have like a separate entry, to have a separate entry on it, right? Is my point, and to cross list it. But then in other cases, we did specifically because it's used more often, right? And you can see what what are going to be the ones that um, are, are going to show up most, um, you know, are going to be. What do we have on these cr cross listed? Of course, Osiris. Right, when we're talking with sort of about funerary cult. I mean, obviously some of these other gods play a big part in that as well, but Osiris is discussed enough that in that particular case and, and Horus, right, there was enough of specific discussion that those we did cross list because 
you don't want somebody to miss out on, because it's such an important part of the argument, right? This is the idea of concept over vocabulary. We didn't want someone to look at the book and miss out on, on these really important points, right? And again, anybody who's coming at this as an Egyptologist is gonna know Osiris is gonna play a big part here, right? But maybe not, right? So we didn't want them to look at this and think, oh, if it wasn't cross-list, it might point be, right? And they didn't think to look at gods, they just looked at Osiris and that's not present they might just not even bother dealing with this book, thinking like, well, I don't know what this book is, about, right? So these are the kind of negotiations that you have to make, right? This is like an intellectual exercise. You have to think about real estate because being too long is problematic, right? So just some specific examples. So back to this point of, of recognizing limitations. So again, think like a reader, right? And that's a good instance of that, right? Where we're thinking about who's going to approach this particular work and for what purposes, right? So something like Osiris being cross-listed is, is kind of an, and it's frankly a negotiation. If we had unlimited space, right? And people had unlimited attention spans to read an index, sure, you could put in like as many cross-references as you want, but that, that's not the reality of it. Yeah. So too many entries, of course, are, are, aren't gonna be useful. And this again, is just what we were talking about, specific examples, right? Of um, knowing, as best you can, right? The actual content of the book and the actual arguments. So what goes in, what is worth cross-listing so that the, the, when someone approaches the book, especially if they're a specialist, right? You want to alert them to the fact that, yes, I talk about this in this book, right? So you might wanna pick it up and read it if that's what you're interested in, right? Um, and the same thing with, we talk about limitations related to cross-listing as well, right? So that's what we just saw also. Not everything needs to be cross-listed. Um, so you have to kind of make the consideration of how important it is within the book, you know? Um, sometimes that's a matter of how much the concept is discussed, right? How, much, how many times does a term appear if we think about it in vocabulary? But if we're thinking about it again, conceptually, this is where it's helpful to kind of know that, right? And then finally, kind of the last point of this, and I mentioned this a little bit before, is um, assume reasonable action by the reader, right? You want to help them out, but probably most people that are going to pick up a book like Julia's book, right, are going to be, um, academics of some sort, right? Um, people that are have dealt with doing research and looking at indices and reading books like this, right? For the most case, right? So you can assume reasonable action on the reader. So this is the kind of thing where, yeah, you, you can't put in every, every cross list, right? But if you put in back to the Ptolemaic example, right? If I put in King, right? And they go to look for Basileus, right? Probably not gonna happen, but if they did and they don't see it there, assume that they're smart enough to, to look under King as well, right? Um, and and so, so that at least gives you a little bit of, of um, cushion in terms of not feeling overwhelmed with having to cover every term that's gonna ultimately be less useful. Okay, okay. <clears throat> so there's just a couple other examples of this, um, um, just briefly, right? To look, think about dead, because obviously this is a case where, um, this is really important for the argument of the book, right? Thinking about the dead, the collective dead, right? And then you can see just, cause this is probably the most complicated one of this. So this is, the slide is just to kind of highlight something I, that I just mentioned, right? To talk about that, but understanding the concept of the book and the argument of the book, right? It should inform the type of index that you make. So here you can see the most cross listed aspects, right? Here you can even see the, the terminal tech or the, the, the um, um, sort of specialized terminology that's being used here. So when we have average dead, right? And we talk about awk, right? And that has a separate entry, right? So here's you're thinking about the reader and taking into consideration the idea that um, this is really um, central for the argument itself. And so this is where the cross-listing, the use of multiple types, right? So you have average, and then you also give the more specific Egyptian term for it, right? All of that kind of work, because in this case, that's so central that, that this is where you want to spend the time in the real estate for the reader. Right? Okay, just looking at time. Okay, strategies. What I mean by this, and I'll, I'll be quicker about this. Um, what do I actually do, right? And this is from process of, of um, trial and error, frankly. Um, so this is something that, especially some of you've done indices before. I, I mean, if we have time to discuss, I'd be really interested to, to see what your strategies are. So this is what's worked best for me. And I, I recognize fully that some of these aspects, um, absolutely, because I'll talk about it. For instance, I do some stuff by hand that you might want to do like digitally, that sort of thing, right? There's probably different ways that are going to work differently for other people. So um, this is what over time has, has worked for me, basically, right? 
Okay, so you begin by breaking the text into different sections, right? Chapters are a natural way to think about it personally, and this is kind of one of those things where it's going to be kind of a personal taste, right? Um, I think around like 10 pages is a little better. So it's going to be, you know, maybe half or a third of a chapter um, it, when, when we break it down into these sections. Um, I just think that's better, you know, in terms of, of giving yourself basically intellectual um, cushioning in some ways, right? And I'll, I'll explain why that, that's important in some ways, right? So think about this breaking it down into different sections to begin with, right? So let's say we have 10 pages, right? The first 10 pages of the book. So here's what I do, right? I read through and underline, right? And I prefer to do this by hand. I have it printed out, but it could be a big waste of paper. So I understand if you don't want to. Um, read through and underline every single word, right? That I think is going to be important. And again, it's it's the concepts that you're looking for, but it, this is where we're talking about the nuts and bolts of okay, the concepts though are related to the vocabulary, right? So I go through literally every word that I think, right, is is important and underline it. One of the things you'll notice in this in, in doing this, right, is that um it, you know, this is kind of the first read through, right? And maybe you want to read it through first just to get, if you're not familiar, you know, again, if it's your book, not a problem, right? But if you're not familiar with the actual concepts, if you have time, maybe read it through as an actual reader once, right? But if this is your kind of way of approaching it. But one of the things you'll notice is when you get later into the process, um, you'll start to identify already like, oh, what are the important words that are going to stick out? And, and it actually gets increasingly easier as you go along because you'll know what words kind of are you're aiming for and how many words appear and what words are going to be important right so this actually becomes easier over time right so start wide and, and edit later right um just i think good practice in general right um this is an important point right is, is that again since we also need to keep track of the the concepts right that aren't just the vocabulary um and so i just do marginalia basically or, or whatever right make little notes in the actual text itself about Here's where what this this is talking about. Again, this is one of the things and the way that I do this, right? I will read it through, as I said, basically about three times. By the time I get to the second or third read through, th those are helpful as like markers, right? But I kind of already know what this is talking about and I know the concepts, right? Um, but still, it's, especially the first time through, like jot those down, right? Just little, you know, nobody's gonna look at it, it doesn't matter, it's your notes, right? Um, just a kind of another strategy is be mindful of images and maps as well. And footnotes, I should add, I mentioned that that earlier. Some of this obviously is gonna be dependent a little bit on like publishers and maybe they won't, they'll ask you not to have this included, right? Or maybe they say, oh, you can only have like a two and a half page index or something. And so you have to leave it out, right? Probably not, not the case in, for most instances, right? But bear in mind images and, and maps, right? I mean, maps are images, but, but um, they're really important. And, and readers are going to want to know where those are. Here's one additional just kind of tip that that I did. Um, I think maybe in the in the second um, book that I indexed, right? Is that it seems a little overwhelming to first start out, right? Is that I actually started with in the book, and then it, I kind of could could um, release these as the more I worked on it, right? But start out with a couple of predetermined categories. So I basically just started with like people, places, and things. Right, meaning that when I'm reading through it, and th this especially because some of this was outside of my field, so that's part of the reason why this was helpful. Um, that I'm going to start with that, right? On this page, I'm just looking for people, places, and things, right? I can always come back, right? I can always come back and, and think about the, the concepts as well, right? But if I want to, if I, I don't want this to be overwhelming, right? And in this particular case, it was because this was an edited volume that um, was looked at things even in, in like the Americas. Um, and I think in East Asia as well. So some of the terminology and stuff um, I, I wasn't as uh, familiar with, right? So this was helpful for me at least to kind of pare it down. So this might be something that if it seems overwhelming, kind of start with this as a, as a tip, right? And, and then again, after you get used to it and kind of get, get rolling, you'll, you'll find that you maybe don't need that anymore, right? And I actually used three different color markers as well, just if, if visually that's helpful for you. Yeah. Okay. So I have now the text itself, right? Let's say 10 pages. And this is why I'm talking about where you break it up, right? So I have 10 pages of, of the text itself. I've gone through, underlined where I think they are, made margins of what I think the concepts are, right? Okay, I then go through and read it again. And on um, this time, what I have is another document, 
right? You could do Excel. I prefer Word. I actually think Word ends up being a lot easier to work with in this case. Right? Excel seems like it's kind of built for stuff like this, but to me, Word is just easier. Um, you write down all of the underlined words, right? And then the corresponding page numbers. So you're reading it and cross-listing it. So a couple of things in this, right? So this is your second time reading it through. Um, the second time you read it through, bear in mind that like, you shouldn't trust that the first time you wrote it through was was perfect, right? So this is actually a second stage of editing as well. And it also is at that stage, right, where you can start to think of, you know, I, I actually don't think this word is that helpful now that I'm like reading it through again. So it becomes the first step of the editorial process, right? Um, and so writing these down, the page numbers and checking for the words that, that already exist, right? And then at this point, right, let's say you've gone through the 10, right, and you can either do this, especially if you're doing by chapter a little bit longer, right, entries for potential alternatives or cross-listed items. One of the reasons why this is important to do in the process of going along, right, so you're writing it and then putting it in, in the page, is that um, once you know these categories exist, it helps you a lot, right, so you're not you don't have to do this all at the end and think about it kind of like it's this big puzzle because you've worked it out a little bit reading it through, right? So creating entries and, and potential alternatives, right? And then um, at the same time, similar type of thing, right? Creating meta categories and subcategories. So gods, for instance, was the, the example that we used with that, right? And this is the editorial process, that sort of thing we talked about. Okay, um, I think we still have time for um, to do this exercise briefly. Julia or anybody? Yes, go for 15 it. Minutes? Okay, mm -hmm. cool. Um, and then did everybody see the Google Drive? Should be able to click on it in the um, in the chat. Yeah, I just placed it in the chat. Okay, so this is the same thing. That, that's just e for easier to, to look at maybe for, for some of you um, rather than having to look at the screen, but it's the same thing we have here. So what I wanna do, let's take five minutes maybe um, and then we'll have time for questions. I, I don't know if there's going to be a ton of questions. So I think this is going to be more a better use of time, right? So th those of you that want to, right, um, take a look at either on here or on the um, link that's been sent. Take like five minutes, and um, you know you can do this kind of mentally if you have, if you can jot it down, right? Um, but let's just go through, um, and you can start at after the divine here after you don't have to, and just. Highlight the words, right? Even if you just don't mentally, and I don't, you don't have time to necessarily go through everything, that's fine. It's just an exercise, right? Of what words you think, right? Potentially should be included within an index, right? And again, you haven't necessarily read this work. Most of you are probably familiar in, in Egyptology with some of these things, right? But let's just go through this and then we'll talk about why certain things might fit versus not. So we'll just give like five minutes to, to kind of go over this and then we'll chat a little bit about it, right? Before we take questions. Sound good? All right. Okay, that's probably um, good enough, right, to just read through it briefly. I know we don't have a ton of time if we want to take questions and things. Um, but I specifically chose this section, again, this comes from Julia's book, um, in that it, it, it introduces the concept that's really important. So we kind of have like the concept built in a little bit, right? And it also introduces, although I don't think this is the first use of it necessarily, but uses a lot of important vocabulary. But I also think there might be some red herrings here a little bit. Um, so we can basically go through I don't, like the practicalities of this, whatever, if, if people want to unmute and talk a little bit about it. Um, so in the first, and anyone can jump in or, or on chat, let's just think about like the first sentence, right? And again, thinking about this in terms of uh, concept over vocabulary a little bit, right? Um, what maybe in that first sentence, right? Everything from despite, we'll start with the after the heading, right? Despite down to believed. Um, if anyone wants to jump in or on, on chat, were there any particular terms that you think might have? Been? Yeah, Helen. So yeah, this one seems dense. Like I, I would want something for tombs or funerary monuments, uh, maybe cross-listed there. I would want yeah. something for afterlife. Um, maybe with underworld and netherworld that get mentioned later. I would want maybe also something for religious belief, which is really the mm -hmm. conceptual category here. Um, so yeah. for that first sentence, maybe those three. Yeah, excellent. Yeah, yeah, I totally agree with that. Did anybody have anything else? And I agree. I, I like, as you said, it's, it's dense here. That's part of the reason I like this particular instance of this. So a lot of things, and I, I like maybe you've indexed before, but but that you're already starting to think of cross-listing and other categories, right? So 
as you go through, if you can do that, this is really great. Um, there might be something in, in chat. Belief, yeah. Um, offerings to the dead, for sure, right? Ideology, that sort of thing, right? Um, let's just move down to the next like three or so sentences, starting with belief we kind of hit on. Um, down to, let's just talk about like, I don't know, ascertain all the way through there, the next kind of chunk of things, if, if anything stands out, you can just kind of do this informally, any, any sort of things in the next big chunk of, of them, so won't go through sentence by sentence, that st stands out to anybody? Yeah, good question about gods, is that is that too broad? So um, th this is the case in, in this specific book, right? So if you look back at the um, actual entry for gods, it actually has gods as kind of a general category before it talks about the individual gods. So this would be a case um, potentially where that fits into that, right? Where it's talking about the gods in general. And this is an important point, right? And this is where understanding the argument a little bit, like this is important, right? Anything else anyone wants to add in there, right? Letters to the dad pyramid text. Yeah, right, absolutely, right? These are things that, that um, identifying primary sources, we could call them, right? Or texts in general, absolutely. I mean, those are things I, I did include, would include, right? Um, we can just kind of go through, uh, um, and, and that appears a, a few other times, right? And some of the things you'll notice already, right, reading through this, right, that, that the first half of the paragraph, a lot of the same terms appear in the second half, or same concepts appear, right? So really you only need one entry for a lot of those things for this um, actual page, sorry, the actual page itself. There's, um, yeah, uh, ghosts, right? Um, that's a good instance of this. and. Um, uh, if is is this the term that's used everywhere, or does this correspond with another term that you're using, right? So this would be absolutely something that would be for me. I would include as a potential entry, and then see that oh, this might be the same concept that's used elsewhere. Um, you know, shades or whatever, divine shades was Roman thing, but the, whatever you know, something similar. Then if it's used elsewhere, basically, um, yeah. So just the last thing. I wanted to highlight, right? There's lots we could do with this, right? Um, just for, for the sake of time. One of the other reasons I wanted to point this out, there's two things that, that I think are a little bit questionable. Well, one I don't think is as questionable, but this idea that introduces of um, Christians and Christianity, right? This is really interesting because um, in the context of what it's talking about, right? So this is an example given, right? This is an analogy, obviously, um, talking about a Christmas tree. Well, it talks about a Christmas tree a number of times, would you put Christmas tree in, in, in the index? No, I don't think so, right? Is anybody going to be opening this book on um, you know, Old Kingdom apotheosis and look for a Christmas tree? No. Is it important for the argument? No, it's an analogy, right? So that wouldn't be included even though it's mentioned here. But then Christianity, Christians, that becomes a little bit trickier, right? Because um, there are other also kind of parallels from what I remember, right? That do talk about Christianity and Christianity is important, right? In other instances. But in this instance, like, is this actually talking about Christianity in any way that's relevant to the actual argument? It's part of this other analogy. So yeah, Christianity in general is an entry, right? And it's used elsewhere because, it, you know, it, it, um, these type of, of uh, divine beings, as, as Julia has educated me on, right, are sometimes called like saints, right? It uses Christian terminology um, before this. And so Christianity appears, but should this entry be included in that, right? It's only talking about Christianity sort of in this larger analogy, right? So that's kind of an open question. So the other reason I wanted to mention this one a little bit is there's a couple of maybe red herrings and those are the kinds of things you'll have to consider basically. Yeah, but definitely the pyramid texts, right? The actual texts themselves and some of the other things we fit on, but these are all gonna be negotiated, right? Some of the things are gonna be pretty obvious need to be included. Others are gonna be kind of up, up to you basically, right? Okay. Um, just, I'm gonna end with this and we, we'll, we'll have questions, right? But, but I'll just end on this very last thing, right? Just finally, some, some last considerations about things, right? Um, when we're talking about indices, obviously there's different types of indices. This is, we're, I've been talking about general index, which is what most of us are gonna be working with. Um, as you know, other books have different indices specifically, right? Index lacorum or whatever, like index for different places or different texts or different names. Yeah, should this be included? Some of this is gonna be right part of the publisher, how much, you know, might be negotiations with them if they want it, demand it, or don't care. Say, yeah, I don't care as long as your index isn't that long, 
right? But I, I would just think about, again, if it's gonna be useful for the book, obviously if you're mostly textual studies, you probably don't need an, an index, M maybe, maybe you do, right? Of places, obviously if you're more archeological, you might be more likely to include that. So just thinking about that, obviously as we know, just other considerations to consider. And then finally, just this last point, is it worth doing an index on your own, right? So again, I'm assuming that for a lot of you that you already have or are going to be um, doing an index for your own work. So again, one of this from a practical standpoint, something I, I know, um, is it's gonna depend a little bit on the publisher and on the contract. Um, some contracts are going to include um, uh, either like an in-house indexer. That's, in, I don't think that's very common actually, but might include funds to hire somebody, right? There are professional people that do this. This is their job, right? So obviously that's gonna be a different consideration. Um, so it's up to you to think about, right? Sometimes you have to pay out of pocket to do it. In a lot of cases, you have to hire somebody to do it, right? Um, so is it worth doing, right? right? Um, Time-wise, it's, it's, it's gonna take a while. You know, I, I, um, maybe 30 hours or something. It's a long time. Um, the advantages of course, right, is that you know the material better. So as long as you can maintain that idea of like the reader not get too self-absorbed with, within your own work, you're gonna know it better. And it also means that you're gonna be a little bit quicker on stuff because you don't need to define the concepts or like try to think about the categorization because you already know them. Right, so that is the one benefit of, of doing it on your own. In my opinion, if, if you get paid, right, um, and, and you trust someone that, that can do it well, you know, it's a lot of work, it's a lot of time. But other considerations, you know, just that sort of thing I wanted to end on, right? Okay, and then questions. Should I just take questions in the chat? Yeah, okay. Um, let's see, Clara. Uh, if approached to index a book as a student, is the expectation that it be volunteer work? Okay, not in my case, I got paid for it. Um, now, it was also in both cases, um, when I did this as a grad student, it was my advisor, so you have to bear in mind, but I got paid. Um, they had funds, and, and by the way, when I was talking about the considerations of like the publishers and stuff, I'm pretty sure in both of those cases, the publishers did not give them money. Um, they used their own research funds, that they, they happen to have research funds, so good, good for them, right? And so I think they used their private research funds to, to pay me. So that was my case. I, I don't remember how much, you know, you know, it, there were other considerations about doing it, as I've mentioned, right? Um, but yeah, I got paid for it. Not Julia didn't pay me, but my advisor paid me. Nope, Julia didn't pay me. Um, okay. Yeah, so I mean, you might be asked to do it. That, that, those are the first two ones that I did were from um, my advisor, and I think that's pretty common. All right, let's see. Digital tools, sorry, I'm going to go up real quick. Are there any digital tools that can help you do this? Word create an index. Yeah, so I mentioned this before that there are professional, there are like actual um, programs that professional indexers use. I don't use them, obviously. That's not my primary job. Um, so I can't tell you or really give you consideration of this. Um, yeah, being familiar with is, is for me, and again, this is going to be one of the things that from the practical standpoint, you're going to think for yourself a little bit of what works best for you. Obviously, it seems like something like even Excel is going to be a little bit. It seems ideal for something like this. It isn't in my case. In Word, it actually works best because ultimately I, I kind of do it manually. And I think that's where I've landed right now is that the most manual you can do it. And in Word, you can still do, you know, alphabetized stuff. And it was just the, it's the cleanest for me and the easiest to see. So that's what I do. But there, there's absolutely actual, like, again, I can't vouch for any of them, but, but the uh, programs exist that, that help with this. I don't know exactly what they do, unfortunately, sorry. Um, no, no, hopeful that, no, no, all this. Just curious, when you generate an index, your word index lists each individual page, which means that one word have manually created the dashes for page ranges. Um, yeah, so um, about the, sorry, the dashes of the pages, right, in there. Um, uh, no, that's something that I, in, in my um, instance, basically you, you have to kind of go through and, and fix on your own, basically. Right. So sometimes in like Word, and this is why I don't like using Excel, is it is trying to help you. And to me, it just complicates things. And so kind of also doing the same thing in, in Word. I mean, combining index with, with proofreading. Um, this is the question, um, would, could one do this at the same time? Um, or like if it's in your own stage of the book, right? Um, I probably wouldn't, right? It always comes in, oh, by the way, yes. I, so I, I'm not entirely sure of, of exactly what the question is asking, but I will actually mention that this happened in every time I think that I did this. I don't remember actually if it happened with Julie, I'm pretty sure it might've, maybe I didn't tell her, but um, 
I found I found um, mistakes when I went through as um, as creating the index. Um, so this happened in um, a, a couple of other instances, um, and I think I told them right here are the problems. I don't remember if those got fixed because it, it's at proof stage, right? So depending on when the timing overlaps, but I absolutely found, and you'll find um, naturally. So again, if it's your own book and, you, and you're not at the stage that you can't change stuff, yeah, you'll absolutely almost certainly find problems with it, right? I, I, I certainly did. Right? Um, drafted index, do you remember any entries being uh, contested or removed by the author, editors? Um, no, not at the stage of I created it. In, in my instance, um, I, I was working with, I had access to the authors themselves, right? So um, there were like considerations about it, right? I wasn't just coming in blindly. Um, so uh, certainly at the stage if I would do something and they might suggest doing something differently. Um, one instance of this, when I was working on some epigraphic stuff that was classical, um, some of the nomenclature, um, we had a negotiation with my advisor basically about the best way to put that in. And so he wanted me to do it a different way. So at that stage, I was able to change it. But, but otherwise, again, it's more of a consideration. And this is why I think of it as a kind of editorial process in, in that way as well. Let's see. Thank you very much, Dr. Brinkman. Um, if you wouldn't mind uh, stopping your share so we can share one more slide. And I believe yes. our um, RC Missouri president might have um, a quick uh, a, a quick comment to highlight some upcoming upcoming events, if I can pull that up. Yes, thank you so much. Uh, that was absolutely fascinating. I'm so glad, Dr. Brinkman, that you were able to do that for us. I think that these sorts of skills are exactly what RC Missouri is hoping to to help share with other people and just kind of, you know, that indexing maybe is not something you ever have a class on, even though you may be expected to publish academically. These are some of the skills that, that are potentially missing from graduate programs or uh, workshops or things like that that are readily available. So it was really fascinating to hear your thought process through this whole thing and, and that you've done so many different kinds of indexes uh, or indices and um, just kind of your process to how you got to what works best for you. And I think that will be something everyone here can take away as well. So start with some of the great tips that you gave us and then see what works best for everybody. So thank you again. Uh, we do have one one last uh, slide here. So this is just a uh, an informational slide about our next activity for RC Missouri, our ne next program, which will be next month. And it disappeared, but it will probably come back in just a moment here. Uh, we're happy to launch another brand new series for RC Missouri. And this is what we're calling our book chats. So in our book chats, we are having a moderated discussion with an author about their work. So next month on the 25th of February, we will have Dr. William Carruthers speak about his very recently published book, Flooded Pasts, UNESCO, Nubia, and the Recolonization of Archaeology. Um, once again, I'd just like to say very, uh, very huge thank you to Dr. Brinkman for this. I'm so glad that we have our professionalization series and looking forward to uh, our next one of those as well. So thank you everyone for spending some time with us on your Saturday and we hope you enjoyed it and we hope to see you again soon. Everyone take care. <laughs>